Okay, so uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we are going to begin uh, today's session by just giving you a brief uh, outline of what we are going to do in this whole week. So the first week and this first session is about. Uh, am I audible to everyone? Can just someone please tell me if I'm audible and visible? Yes, sir. You are audible and visible. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, I just wish to give you a brief outline of what we are going to do in this whole week. The first week and the first theme that we have taken in this course is uh, of biodiversity and conservation. And we are going to talk a little bit about uh, different aspects of biodiversity conservation starting from what is the whole profile of India's biodiversity, what are the problems associated with it, and the methods and different policies which are associated with biodiversity conservation, some sort of threats we will discuss. But we will mostly try to bring in uh, you know, aspects which are related to protection, not only within the protected areas that we have, but also outside protected areas that we have in India. So uh, as you must have seen, and uh, as because this is the first uh, you know, uh, formal session of this course, I would like uh, again to tell you that please go through the website very regularly. So we will keep on updating the schedule of the you know, uh, of various lectures, and we'll also keep on updating different. Uh, you know, we will, we are also posting lecture uh, you know, uh, recordings on the website, so you will find all of the all of it there. You will also get to know about the information about your assignments from the website, so that is also there. So keep on going through that. Now, if you look at the first, uh, you know, uh, un uh, first theme that we are going to cover, there are three speakers after me. So today is the first inaugural se uh, first session of this uh, this particular theme, and uh, this will be. Uh, I'll, I'll, we'll talk a little bit about the introduction to India's biodiversity. If you have gone through the uh, the website, you would have seen that this is the theme that we have uh, or sub theme that we have uh, kept to discuss today. And then after me, there are three different speakers who will be, uh, you know, will be coming, and we have invited them. Their, uh, you know, ex respective experts from different uh, from their own fields. So on twenty first of August, uh, Dr. K. S. Gopi Sundar is coming, and he will be talking about conservation outside protected areas. Now that is a very interesting. Uh, uh, Dr. Sundar is the chair of IUCN committees and uh, Species Survival Commission as well. So he has worked a lot on the conservation of species outside our national parks and wildlife sanctuaries. Now, this is one aspect that we tend to always forget that, okay, we have a large amount of piracy even outside the protected areas, which do not enjoy any legal protection status, but definitely they have certain amount of, uh, no, they have a large amount of threat that they face in their natural habitats. So that is the first lecture. And then the second, uh, the, the third lecture of this uh, series will be by Dr. G. V. Gopi. Now he is an expert on wetland conservation. He has worked extensively in Bhitar Kanika mangroves in Odisha. So he will be taking up the uh, the ideas related to wetland conservation. What are the various threats? What are the various challenges that uh, the wetlands as a as a prime habitat for a large number of species for a very wide uh, you know uh, biodiversity? Uh, we can say what are the threats that they face? What are the various challenges which are associated with? So he will be talking about that. And the last. Uh, no uh, uh, lecture in this particular theme is by Dr. Abdel Jamil Urfi. Now he is a leading ornithologist in India. He has done a lot of research in birds. He has written a whole book on what we call uh, on a species painted straw. So he will be talking about bird studies and how citizen science mostly will uh, will help in uh, conservation of biodiversity. So we have tried to cover almost everything from different aspects from and 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 considering that biodiversity and conservation is a very uh, uh, you know, uh, wide theme and which encompasses not only wildlife conservation issues but several other issues as well. So we will try to bring in everything together, and then in the same uh, you know, week, you will uh, and from the same theme, uh, you will have one assignment, a small assignment but a very interesting one, which we have uh, designed for you. So we will be posting that assignment in a day or two once you get some idea that what we are going to discuss in this whole session. Okay, so uh, let me start with today's, uh, with that uh, outline, let me start with today's uh, you know, lecture and today's session. Okay. So. Okay, so uh, someone just let me know if my screen is visible and the PowerPoint presentation is visible to you. Yes, yes. So it is visible. Okay. Thank you. So uh, we are going to talk about biodiversity and introduction to India's biodiversity. Now, this is a uh, to keep it a little bit interesting. I have divided this whole uh, session into three parts: the past, present, and future. 
so we'll be talking about past we'll be talking a little bit about what we have done in the past what we did and what we uh, what we had and what we did what kind of piracy profile that we had in india and what we did with it and then the second part of this uh, uh, this lecture will be about uh, what we have and what are we doing with it and the third and the last will be what we will have in future if we continue exploiting our biodiversity and the at the current level of uh, you no know, consumption which is highly unsustainable as we know of so what we will have what we will be left with and what we should do to protect that so past present and future these three different aspects that we'll be talking about so the coverage will be this like this we have a long two hour session so what i thought is that we will divide this session into two parts so instead of taking all the question answers at the end we'll take a small break in between and we'll have a question answer session there so once we finish the first part which is what we had and what we did we'll talk about so the history of biodiversity conservation or uh, uses as we uh, will see in a moment so uh, then we'll have a question answer session and then a break and then we will take two other uh, themes or two other sub topics as we say what we have and what we will have and then again at the end we'll have a quest some question answer sessions okay so let's start with the first uh, part what we had and what we did so uh, historically and in in all of these uh, different sub themes uh, we will be talking mostly about india although uh, we have at some some places where the topic will demand we will take a much more wider global coverage of biodiversity profile but in most of the cases we will be talking uh, taking examples case studies stories narratives from india okay so and this is the first thing that i want to discuss with you a very interesting aspect uh, of biodiversity conservation that most of the time is not discussed so stories from past and as we all know that we should definitely learn a lot of uh, you know uh, we should know that what we did in past and what wrongs we did and uh, to get some sort of uh, you know uh, idea that what interventions policy interventions scientific interventions should have been implemented at that point of time and so that all these things should not have happened so in this whole session i'll be uh, the first part we'll have four stories of four species from two centuries and i just chronologically arranged those four stories the first story is a sad sad demise of martha uh, coming from 1813 and then playing with big cats 1800 to 1958 and then we'll talk about amur killings in northeast 1985 and then pangolin roll so these four interesting stories we will take up and we will discuss them one by one so the first story if we see is of a bird bird named martha now the first thing that will come to your mind that uh, why this bird was so special that uh, you no know, she was named and martha is not a very flat shape or a, you can say very majestic species of bird it is just a pigeon so what uh, let the people and the scientists of the world to name a pigeon is is very interesting now martha is a species of passenger pigeon as we know and the story is from united states of america 1813 the first time james audubon he was a ornithologist and he also later on uh, went on to establish and begin the famous audubon society in america which is one of the leading conservation society in us and also around the world so the first thing that uh, no so in 1813 when john audubon he was traveling in the countryside and he saw a huge flock of passenger pigeons passing through above a village and what surprised him a lot was this single huge flock of passenger pigeon took 3 days 3 days to fly past him and the flock was also so dense that the entire village was covered in darkness so this was the abundance of this particular species in america in north america not only us but us and canada both and in north america at that point of time so around uh, you know billions of uh, you know these passenger pigeons were there now in 1900 these north american passenger pigeons which were almost one of the most uh, you know can say numerous bird species on earth they were completely disappeared from wild now what happened now these passenger pigeons were uh, very easy to kill you don't even have to aim to kill one of them all you have to do is to 
point your gun towards aim your gun towards the sky and keep on firing something will fall they had such dense flocks passing above our heads and they were killed for three very basic simple reasons food feathers and fun so we can just imagine what kind of uh, you no know, mistakes at one point of time that we did because we um, and why this story is also important is the fact that they were so abundant so there is no knowing that these are going to be extinct i mean we will always take them for granted the species so abundant jaise hum aaj hamare aas pass jo pigeons hote hain uske bare mein hum sochte hain ki they are so abundant they are everywhere but if we go on with this kind of indiscriminate killing at a, for a very long period of time we would realize that even these passenger pigeons uh, can get killed so uh, <clears throat> what is important is that we understand this whole uh, uh, idea that uh, a species is never stable the population is never stable so this massive killing of passenger pigeon led to the extinction of the entire population and uh, by the time uh, in 1914 the i'll just go back to the slide martha why she was named martha was named because she was the only the world's last living passenger pigeon she was a female and in the uh, ohio cincinnati zoo in uh, in 1914 she died and that was the end and that was the extinction and uh, of a part of, of the whole species and uh, that's why the the story is is named as the sad demise of martha and why this story had a significant significance in terms of uh, or its role uh, just a second give me a moment there is some technical glitch i'll want to fix it Yeah, uh, my slide is back. Yes, yes, sir. sir. Ah, okay, thank you. So, yes, so we what what we realized is that uh, over a period of time, even a species as abundant as abundant as passenger pigeon can go extinct if we keep on killing them, uh, you no, know, in in large numbers. And the extinction of Martha was also a beginning of a new era of biodiversity and conservation. Before that, the whole idea of conservation was actually a charade, and nobody, uh, you no, know, actually paid a, you no, know, give uh, give good attention to it. So then the whole story of biodiversity and conservation came into fore, and then we started talking about saving species and conserving. Now the second story that we're going to talk in this uh, series is playing with big cats. Now, how we have played with big cats, and in in what we take here is an example, or or the of a very active species, uh, or the national animal of India, is the tiger. So what we did with tiger, and where are we? now you will see this image that uh, the, this graph the growing number of tigers over a period of time in india starting from 2006 when we had around 47 tigers in india till today when we have roughly around 2967 tigers in india around 3000 tigers in india and we feel very good about it we pat ourselves on our back saying that the project tiger bahut acha hua project tiger se tiger number se itne bade hamare forest mein our forest cover has improved the tiger number has improved in indian forest but uh, what this and what we do not discuss much is from where have we came back to this number of 1411 from where we started and from and where we reached so uh, the tiger census started only after 1972 when the project tiger was launched but before that we did not have, we, we didn't have any tiger census in india but we have some numbers in fact yesterday we had a wonderful lecture by professor mahesh rangrajan now in his one of his book he is the only one who has pointed this out he has calculated estimated the number of tigers in 1875 so he estimated through this number through the number of huntings and killings that happened during that time so the number of tigers which were killed which were reported to be hunted and killed and which were killed as the game animals which were killed as trophy animals so he estimated that number and put that number to 120000 in 1800 so imagine uh, we we are very happy knowing that we are growing our tiger numbers from 1411 to 3000 uh, in past 20 years in in 15 20 years but but see from 1800 in india we had 120000 tigers now this is a number which you will not find in most of the places in most of the reports 
So from that one lakh twenty thousand, we now are now at three thousand. So we definitely should not be happy. Uh, I think someone's uh, uh, microphone is switched on. If you can please switch it off, there will be less noise. Thank you. So uh, looking at the this figure, and and then there are so many things that happen in between. Now this is an image. This is a a, a Persian miniature uh, painting. Now this is a this is images of a Mughal emperor Akbar, who was one of the greatest Mughal ruler. And since that time, we have we can see in these miniature paintings that uh, the royal hunting or what we call as the shikar was one of the most uh, uh, you know favored game or sport for maharajas and and uh, the elite of that time. So. Uh, even when the Mughal dynasty fell uh, after uh, you know, uh, after 1857 and, and and those times, so it just will continue. So I'll just go on and show you a couple of images that will uh, talk, uh, you know, show you what kind of tiger brutality that we have done in past. And these, this is the this is the story of and how we have played with big cats. So that's the title of the story that we have uh, given the playing with big cats. So these were the stuff. Uh, uh, some officers of British Raj, they're staging their big uh, game hunts and they're just showcasing their royalty, their machismo, their power and their wealth that yes, we are the wealthy ones, we are the powerful ones, we will go, we should go out in the forest and kill some animals, display them. And surprisingly, this image, uh, uh, you will also see there is a rhino uh, among between these uh, first, second, third tiger, there is a rhino head, uh, just the head, not the whole animal, kept as a trophy display. So these kind of huntings, these kind of shikar parties were one of the most common and prevalent uh, 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 hunting and, and, and games at the time. So uh, this image, uh, once, just a second. Yes. Is my slide visible to everyone? Yes, okay. yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Thank you. So, yes, sir. So the the hunting. Uh, now, this is an image. Interesting image. Uh, this is a uh, first Mark's cousin of Kettleston and his wife, uh, who visited India in 1903. Uh, they also killed a tiger, and this is hunting by George's cousin himself. Now, this image is very interesting. So, after the King George V ascended his throne in 1911, uh, he apparently he came to India. I'm not exactly India. But the territory where India and Nepal is bordering, that is the Chitwan National Park right now. So, and he killed 39 tigers in 10 days. So in 10 days of time, he killed 39 tigers. And on those uh, uh, widely laid out bamboo poles, you can see those tiger skin uh, drying. And uh, by just looking at this uh, uh, horrible image, you'll get some idea that what kind of brutality that we have done with tigers and what kind of you know, killing had taken place in past as far as the tigers are concerned. And these are some of the very much re the reason why the tiger number in India started from 120 and 1,20,000 and to 3,000 what we have today. Then uh, there's another picture. That, uh, this is an image of, uh, you know, the, the people here are unknown, but looking and, and the image was also very there. But looking at the people uh, standing on both sides, they are probably the servants of of uh, these British officers, the image looks from India. Uh, and to tell you, some of these images are very rare to find, and some of these images are also, uh, no, you don't have a no, good source to know that who is in that image, and it's very difficult to know that. Now, another image, uh, you no know, Indian Maharaj, uh, Indian British officers going out in the forest, killing roughly around three tigers in a day. Now, this image is of, uh, Colonel Geoffrey Nightingale, who shot more than 300 tigers in India. Now, he has a very interesting uh, habit of keeping up a notebook. So he he kept a notebook with him and he had uh, very meticulously written the Shikar stories of almost every tiger he shot down in Indian forests. So he his number was roughly around 300. And I'm sure that you will not definitely not be very happy to see these images. But yes, he should know what had happened. Uh, that's another image. You can see a servant, uh, you know, uh, you know, of of some of the British officers standing behind the tiger. This image apparently is from Assam. So this is uh, the area of Kaziranga, which is today we know that is a very prime habitat for one-horned rhinoceros. 
but uh, it is also a very it was a very good habitat for tigers at one point of time but now the tiger population there has dwindled and what we see today um, is is a very few number of tigers handful of tigers i think 15 to 18 tigers that we have there but you can see in this image you'll see i can at least see six or seven tigers killed and and uh, unhunted in a day now this is a very interesting image that uh, you know shows the power the wealth and uh, the charisma of our indian maharajas uh, during the british era uh, only so uh, i really uh, no, uh, no. Uh, this image interests me a lot. So, in 1920, this image comes from that time, and the person in this image uh, sitting on his, uh, you know, Rolls Royce Phantom. Uh, that's the that's the model of Rolls Royce, a very expensive car. Now he got it imported, and uh, he is Maharaja Umid Singh of Kota, Rajasthan. So Maharaja Umid Singh uh, uh, imported this Rolls Royce from, uh, uh, no, 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 uh, from Europe, and he turned this into a shikar vehicle. So he had established some of these shikar guns in the front bonnet of the car. He had had those uh, uh, automatic uh, uh, weapons which can throw out uh, harpoons, uh, you know, sort of thing. So he turned this whole you know, uh, very expensive uh, phantom into a shikar vehicle, which he used for his shikar uh, you know, uh, parties. And in this image, you can see he is so proudly uh, posing himself with four of these tigers and, and his role as phantom. So it can just show you that what kind of uh, uh, you know, things have happened. And, and uh, so that's another uh, interesting image that we have. The Prince of Wales of uh, you know, his shooting his tiger in 1976. Now this image is very interesting. Now this is an image from Shimla. Now a lot of us uh, go to hill stations very often and we have some idea that Pahadope tigers are not here usually. So Shimla, oh, ya Uttarakhand, you don't see tigers over there. But in Himachal, there was a good number of tiger population in the lower Himalayan foothills. And uh, this is one of them. And it killed in 1876. And uh, Prince of Wales shot uh, uh, in Simla. Now, this is another interesting image. And the story behind this image is also very interesting. So uh, the person, uh, you know, the small kid uh, you know, uh, in, the, in the center of this image is uh, the Maharaja of Jaipur and uh, he, he became king. He uh, ascended his throne in uh, somewhere in 1800 or something. Uh, and I don't exactly remember the year, but somewhere in 1800. So it was a custom then when a young boy ascends the throne, he has to go through what we call a coming to age or the coming to age ritual that the young boy has now grown into a, uh, 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 is into a fully grown king. So he has to go through that ritual and he is, uh, he is no more a prince now, he is a king now. And the to do that, to do so, to uh, fulfill the coming to age ritual, he killed 109 tigers in a span of two years to show that now he has turned into a fully grown king and he no longer uh, uh, is a, 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 a young boy. So this coming to age ceremony, 109 tigers killed. So that's another image where you can see a couple of tigers killed. And uh, again, the hunting image from India. Now, this is the Viceroy of India, Viceroy reading, standing in the picture. Again, a very rare image, but uh, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm sure that you will be very much disturbed by looking at these images, I could say, uh, <clears throat> and what had happened. Now, this image uh, is also, uh, this is, uh, uh, again, an image from 1906, uh, uh, this is again Prince of Wales, George Prince of uh, No Fifth, uh, and Prince of Wales, uh, you know, killing these uh, animals: two leopards, one tiger. Uh, so uh, that's another image. Uh, uh, so this is post 1947. Now this is another interesting image because uh, all of you might think that all of these things must have happened before India got independent. Because post independence, we have everything in a right way, in a right path. But uh, I would disappoint you a little bit. Uh, uh, by this. Now, in this image, uh, the person whom we see on the uh, on the elephant's back is the Maharaja of Surbuja in Chhattisgarh. Now, he uh, in 1965 wrote a letter to George Scholar, one of his friend in England, who was also one of his shikar friend, a British shikar friend, with whom he used to go out on shikar parties a lot in his state. So he wrote a letter to him saying that uh, 
uh, actually bragging his achievement that I have killed 1150 tigers, 1150 tigers in uh, in a span of past 15 years, and he gave him a detailed description of all of his killings. So, just by all the images that we have seen, would uh, would would tell you a little bit of. Uh, give you a little bit of background that what kind of hunting has happened as far as the tiger numbers are concerned or kis tarah se tiger numbers jo hai hamara 120000 se kam hote hote today what we see has uh, you know gone down to as low as 3000 now this one is uh, the most interesting image and perhaps will give you a good amount of laugh i would i would like all of you to read the text in this image so the and also I'll read it for you. The thrill to the excitement of a tiger shikar found only in the last jungles of India. Fishing and small game hunting too awaits the adventurous sportsman. Now this is an advertisement posted by Government of India Tourist Office in the New York Times in 1950. Post-independence, three-year post-independence, Government of India Tourist Office posting a advertisement in New York Times that we have a whole jungle open with large opportunity of tiger shikars and tiger hunting. So come, come out here and enjoy and have some adventure, have some game hunting and enjoy your time. So this is this is what we have to propose as as one of the attraction of tourism in India in nine in nineteen fifty. So but that's another really uh, you know sad story that has happened. So we should know all of these things. So, so why we are discussing this? I think by the, this time you would have got the idea behind this that the whole point of discussing all these images and all these stories was the fact that we should understand that this is where we have come from this is where we started actually when we when we can have all the uh, you know uh, other discussions later on but to know our past is very important okay so that's the end of the second story now the third story that we have uh, is that of amur killings in northeast amur falcons a very uh, interesting bird which is actually a migratory bird so it starts migrating in india from mongolia from russia and every year in the month of september uh, it starts its migration it in it starts its migration a bit early it reaches in india at the time september october so if you can see in this image uh, on your uh, uh, note uh, in the top right hand side so it starts its migration from mongolia it's it makes a pit stop in nagaland and then it goes back goes to the Cape of Good Hope and uh, to the Africa. So basically, these Amur falcons are migrating from their breeding grounds in Eastern Asia and to their venting grounds in South Africa. Okay. Now, this is the largest migratory distance covered by any raptor species, even and which includes a circular migration of 20,000 kilometers annually. So they fly from uh, the from Eastern Asia, from Mongolia, Russia to Africa which makes a 20,000 kilometer of a circular migration route. So what happens with these species? So around this, along this route, I'll just go back to the last slide. Uh, along this route, if you can see, they are making a pit stop in Nagaland. The reason behind that pit stop is that after Nagaland, there is all ocean. They have to cross the Indian Ocean, the Arabian Sea, to reach the, uh, the Cape of Good Hope. Now, they won't because they are raptors. They won't find any food in between. So they stop at Nagaland. They uh, you know eat and and feed themselves well and prepare them for the next uh, level of their migration. So to to fuel themselves off for this big open uh, water crossing, these Amur falcons are stopping over the Nagaland. They're feasting on a seasonal eruption of around large number of termites from the ground. This is the time when when the the termites will come out of the ground the mid october and the 1st of november and uh, these amur falcons will feed on those termites uh, gain a lot of energy uh, and and then they will start the next stage of their migration from northeast india to the cape of good hope but then what happened so if uh, if you know the story in northeast they have been killed in large numbers extensive killing of amur falcons in northeast has taken place even till now <coughs> until a couple of uh, months uh, back, a couple of years back, this whole killing had been happening over there. So you can see uh, the, the these killings had actually led to a, 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 a decline in the population of Amur Falcon in large numbers. So much so, the Russian government wrote to the Indian embassy and said that uh, we, you, uh, you know, we should take some, the Indian government should 
take some steps for conservation of amur falcons in northeast because it is a bird of russia and because if we if we kill all of them here uh, nothing will be going back after the return migration begins so uh, so that's uh, a very sad story and that's that's the story of amur falcon killings in in northeast so uh, uh, there is a small uh, 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 no film a small documentary that i want to show you here just a uh, one and a half minute and uh, then we will again resume the stories further so just give me a moment before i uh, no start that film for you and uh, do let me know if the sound is audible to you or not or if there is any technical glitches so we cannot hear there is no sound okay okay let me let me correct that uh, i think uh, i must not have selected something just just let me correct that okay just give me a moment share audio <laughs> Imagine traveling from Kashmir to Kanyakumari non-stop. The Amur falcons fly seven times that distance during yeah, their migration, and that too within a few days. You Between have sound Russia now. Russia and Africa, their last pit stop yes, yes, is a small village in Nagaland. Pampi village hosts the single largest congregation of Amur falcons anywhere in the world. The falcons rest for two months. at the doyong reservoir before flying over the indian ocean towards africa at just 150 grams an amur falcon is a small bird the amur falcons is said to be from a subspecies called red-footed falcons they are also called manchurian falcons the male is mostly gray in color and the females have dark streaked cream or orange underparts The birds usually fly from Nagaland non-stop for 5 days and 10 hours covering 5600 kilometers before alighting in Africa. This is just a small part of the 22000 kilometer circular migratory journey of the birds. Pangti is the rest and relaxation stop for these birds before they embark on the final and the longest leg of their journey. However, their stay at the village hasn't always been smooth.
okay so uh, that was the uh, you no know, a small narrative of uh, about the uh, you no know, the amur falcons in northeast and uh, and as we discussed a large number of these amur falcons they aggregate there in the and there is a small village called panti in, in nagaland as they were uh, saying so they uh, they aggregate in that village in very large numbers they also come to nearby places and after that we have just discussed what the how the story goes now the next and the last story in this uh, in the sequence uh, i think this is the second last story okay the this is the killing of sanda now what is sanda is a the it's a it's a small uh, uh, as you can say it's a lizard and uh, this is a lizard of thar desert now these are also known as spiny tailed lizard now they are found in the you know, in, a, in a in a large area in the, in the desert of thar the run of kutch and some of the uh, the adjoining semi arid regions of india and both pakistan and they are killed uh, so uh, and then the, the image on the inset there is then uh, is a lager falcon uh, you know which is uh, for whom the the sanda or the spiny tail lizard is one of the most staple food so they are uh, so that's a part of the food chain so the natural killings are not the offset for the population of uh, of spiny tail lizards in uh, in uh, in, in the thar desert but what actually is the offset to the population is the wrong belief that the oil extracted from the uh, spiny tail lizard they have some a layer of fat or subcutaneous fat tissue beneath their skin so the oil extract extracted from that tissue uh, is believed to be a cure for various ailments including muscular uh, pain uh, joint pains and and bone issues and impotency so they are they are killed in large numbers for these uh, for these oils now this is an image from jaisalmer where uh, uh, you know a group of people sitting on the road side they have killed these sandas and just to so why they are uh, they have also kept the these uh, animals on the display so that the buyers would know that these are the authentic oil that they are purchasing and they have just been taken out from these uh, spiny tail lizards to to attract their buyers they have also kept the dead animals right in front of them so they are hunted and killed in large numbers in the in the khyber and the pashtun region in pakistan in the sindh region of pakistan and in india the adjacent uh, parts here in rajasthan so in the large numbers they have been killed and uh, sometimes also for their meat but mostly for the oil which comes from the sand uh, from sanda and in india you can see even the young kids just being arrested uh, for this uh, heinous crime but uh, the, some of them are very very young and in fact uh, no they probably would not even know that the wildlife protection act 1972 prevents the killing of sanda it is a scheduled one species animal uh, scheduled one species so uh, killing is completely prohibited so that's that's the you know uh, uh, a sad part that's another species which is facing serious threat uh, you know uh, and and which has faced threat in past now the latest story that we have uh, is the pangolin roll now pangolin is as as uh, commonly referred to as the scaly ant eaters and they are reported to be among the most traded and trafficked wildlife species globally so that is the most important uh, you know uh, uh, pointer for pangolins that we should know that we have heard a lot about elephant ivory trade we have heard a lot about tiger skin and tiger bone trade we you would also heard about trading of turtles but this is the most highly trafficked wildlife species in the world and uh, the organization traffic uh, they have done a study and they found that around 6000 uh, illegal uh, uh, you know pangolins were uh, you know recovered by forest department and various custom agencies in a very small span of time 2009 to 2017 6000 species uh, 6000 individuals uh, they were captured from wild so if you look at this image uh, this is a report of traffic only so traffic is an ngo which works for wildlife trade monitoring uh, no and 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 uh, no works for stopping wildlife trade so these indian pangolins they have killed in large numbers so why are they killed now some of the uh, in some places in china uh, they wrongly i might add they wrongly believe that the scales the preparations made from the scales of these uh, spiny uh, the, the 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 spiny ant eaters or what or the pangolins can cure diseases related to kidney 
so it has some sort of blood purific uh, no uh, purification uh, no of of blood and 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 urine so helps in that so it has some some sort of medical properties and can be used for kidney cure it is also post for their scales body parts and meat and uh, although as i told you uh, in wildlife protection act 1972 it is a schedule 1 species in cites which is the convention on international trade in endangered species we will talk talk about it later so uh, this is an international uh, uh, <coughs> policy or legislation as you can say an international agreement which basically restricts the trade of animals across international borders so uh, you know uh, if you are trading any animal which is in the cites index and if you are trying to take it from india to nepal on the border the customs have the right to stop you and catch hold of those species and also arrest the person who is doing that so cites appendix 1 schedule 1 species in india in wildlife protection act suffering a huge loss by just hunting so that's the uh, another story of pangolin and uh, again i would just like to show you a small documentary because that will give you an idea that what kind of hunting happens with pangolin and then we will uh, uh, go ahead so just give me a moment to set that up so so i think uh, okay so that is actually the end of the first session that we wanted to have so what we had and what we did uh, that part we have already discussed so let us have uh, take a small break and that break is actually for just for us to uh, you know uh, you know take a note of what we have already discussed and if you have any questions uh, and i would love you to ask questions switch off your mic switch on your microphone and ask questions that will make it a little bit more interactive rather than typing questions so if you have any questions anything that we want to discuss anything that we want to bring up let's uh, do it at least for this section and then we will start with the next ses uh, section of our today's uh, session so why are amur falcons being killed i mean why are they killed we know a reason for all the others but amur falcons just for fun yes questions queries if you have any one hello am i audible you want, add, you want to discuss anything that you want to ask am i audible I sir Rishwa, I think you are not audible to him. I think you should type. We are taking message. five minutes of break from, like, say, three fifteen. Uh, we can resume at three twenty. But uh, meanwhile, those who have questions, they can ask, and we will uh, take have the break recording. 
also. Okay, sorry, Riswa, you are not audible to me. Can you please repeat your question? Sir, am I audible now? Yeah, you are, you are now. Okay. So I am saying, sir, we uh, you told us the reason why all the other birds and animals were killed, but Amur falcon, why are they killed? Just for fun. Food. Amur falcon, despite of the fact that they look uh, like a very slender bird, and uh, uh, they provide a, they are a good source of meat, so they are killed for food. Okay. But that's the only reason that I know of of killing of Amur falcons, and they are also as I. As you would have probably seen in that uh, small video, they are killed in large numbers. They are killed in huge quantities, indiscriminate commercial quantities, actually. Okay. Good afternoon, sir. Good Am afternoon. I audible? Good afternoon. Okay, sir. In context of tiger killing, um, in class twelve, we read a story of somewhat like the Tiger King who killed ninety-nine tigers just to prove that he is strong, and that he will die with a hundred tigers of killing. So, what are your views? Should the government remove such kind of stories, which become a threat for our biodiversity? Uh, can you just repeat the last part of the question a little uh, once again, a little bit louder? Okay. Okay. Um, so, sir, uh, in class twelve, we had read a story of the Tiger King, in which um, the Tiger King kills the ninety-nine tiger, and he will die with the death of the hundred tiger. Um, so, my so I want to ask uh, that the government should remove this kind of story. Which become a threat for our biodiversity. So, uh, I actually your voice is 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 breaking a bit, and I'm not able to hear it. Probably because of some network issue. It would be great, Priya, if you just type your question here and put it. In the meanwhile, I'll take another question. Okay. Sir, actually, if you want, I, Priya, I can repeat your question. Am I audible? Ha, yeah, she is audible. Which one is audible? Okay, yeah, so I can see a question here by Hemlata. So I will just take up that, and meanwhile you can type your question here in the chat box. So she asked that my question, especially in rural area, hunting is most common thing. So in this case, important thing is uh, to aware pe people uh, from rural background more rather than be enforced on act. Yes, of course. Now the whole uh, no the the theme of conservation of biodiversity basically starts with what we uh, know the idea. Or it comes with how we are going to incorporate the local people. So the right of of people, the indigenous people, the local people, villagers, farmers is much more than us on the forest resources of the world. So uh, it is very important that we should understand that that right should not be uh, you know infringed anywhere. In fact, that is the whole reason that why the government is actually delineating some of the protected areas like national parks and wildlife sanctuaries. In national park, no. Uh, no local movement is allowed but in a wildlife sanctuary a large number of local movement is allowed people can go inside the forest no they can also they also have the right to exploit the forest resources up to some extent which is called the har such as harvesting of honey bees harvesting of uh, leaves harvesting of wood and 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 so on and so forth but uh, the hunting by rural people is actually i mean despite uh, one thinks that it is not a very general practice now hunting of i have never seen any uh, no <coughs> villager or any forest dwelling community to go out in the forest and kill a tiger it is rare although in some parts of tibet they are tigers are killed for uh, you know for using their skin in some tribal customs and rituals but india mein utna nahi hai this is not a major issue but what what we should ensure that the rights of forest dwelling people has to be ensured in in the forms of जो हम अभी आगे डिस्कस भी करेंगे ज्वाइंट फॉरेस्ट मैनेजमेंट है छोटे छोटे स्टेप्स हैं जिससे हम फॉरेस्ट राइट भी उनको दे रहे हैं एंड देन वी आर डेफिनेटली नॉट एनफोर्सिंग एनी एक्ट ऑन देम सो दिस इज इंपॉर्टेंट दिस इज अ वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट क्वेश्चन दैट हाउ आर वी गोइंग टू स्ट्राइक दैट बैलेंस सो दैट्स देयर सर मिस्टर आस्क दैट पांगती इन नागालैंड हैज एनी स्पेशल हैबिटेट नो इट डजंट हैव एनी स्पेशल हैबिटेट इट इज जस्ट लाइक एनी अदर विलेज इन नॉर्थ ईस्ट द रीजन व्हाई दे कम टू पांगती बिकॉज़ मोस्ट ऑफ दीस बर्ड्स हैव they uh, you know they have their set migratory path and over a period of time they are just uh, the the imbibing the knowledge of their migratory path in their generations so every time they come they follow the same path they stop at the same place and and go to the same place so it's just like that uh servant most, most people uh, are not aware about protection of our mother nature how to prevent such a brutal practice make them aware so uh, it is the most important thing that uh, we should uh, you know keep people aware of uh, the fact that uh, our compassion towards wildlife and nature is not just a means of compassion 
but it is also the question of our own survival so we can only survive when we keep the world around us surviving and in the last unit we will also discuss about what we will have in future so we will discuss this a little bit there uh, okay so next question is by uh, priya sir in class 12 we had read a story of tiger king in which the tiger king kills the 100 tigers just to prove the priest's horoscope wrong okay okay interesting so sir should the government remove these kinds of stories which can become a threat to our biodiversity okay it is uh, uh, i don't think this is this kind of story is doing much harm to our biodiversity per se because uh, in in panchatantra we have all whole lot of stories uh, of of different animals and coming in different forms so uh, you know for instance there is a uh, a, a, a fake fox uh, colored in blue indigo and comes to the village but we don't kill fox because of that so i think we should understand the theme uh, you know anyone who is you know either reading this story or teaching this story should let the people know or the students know <coughs> that the idea is just to have uh, you know uh, some sort of uh, you know uh, information about wildlife but not definitely not killing inspiration uh sir when the video is being recorded didn't the video recorder ask them to stop why they hadn't stopped the hunters instead of making a video very good question ragini the video was recorded by the forest uh, department of nagaland and all those people who uh, who are in the video they also went behind bars so uh, let me assure you the uh, no the video was just to made for recording or documentation so that in the court and the ngt when the case goes they will have a uh, documented proof and then they were behind the bars so they were all arrested and 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 got what they had coming priya so in the context of bartha as i had observed that sparrows which can see easily chirping around are in visible what are the reasons for this decline now the decline of sparrows uh, is a is a myth now i'll disappoint you a little bit by saying that you let us also put our heads around what is the real problem Now, most of the time when we when we talk of conservation of biodiversity and conservation issues where we get lost is is by the media reports coming of species which are actually not declining but creating a huge fuss about it so sparrow is just a huge fuss of declining populations yes sparrow in cities have declined the reason behind that decline is very simple the architectural design of the city has changed now we do not have those uh, ventilators in our houses where these sparrows used to nest we do not have those uh, uh, fans uh, no large ceiling fans in which there was a cup like this in which the sparrow used to nest so uh, the lack of available habitat for some of these species may have led to their decline but over a period of time if you see uh, it's not a major issue we'll discuss in the last slide sparrows in india are growing overall cities they have declined now uh, has an indian government taken any step to stop the extensive killing of mammoth falcon yes a large amount of that killing has been stopped uh, courtesy not much of the indian government but some of the ngos there and the forest department of nagaland pangolin species represent in india species name where they were seen in india uh, pangolin species we have a uh, uh, <coughs> uh, so one of the species of pangolin that we uh, the indian pangolin that we have in india is seen everywhere and one of the because they are nocturnal species so you might not know where they are found but uh, uh, they are seen in uh, uh, i will just give you the confirmed sightings they are seen in uttarakhand i have seen them in corbett i have seen them in uh, uh, tal chapar in rajasthan uh, so uh, and and I, they are almost everywhere you just have to go out at night and see them uh, chidiya or the common bird is no longer seen anywhere again it is the question is about uh, our urbanization and deforestation the reason for it tanu so uh, uh, the the sparrows again as i told you the, the sparrows were commonly known as chidiya so uh, the decline and the reason for the decline was definitely because of uh, you know uh, as i told you city may decline hui hai is loss of habitat declining uh, or decline in the uh, you know the architectural structure jisme wo nesting kar sake and then uh, there were some reports also coming about mobile towers and it effects but there was they were not conclusive and scientific reports so forget about those but otherwise let me assure you the sparrow or what we know as called chidiya is available in good numbers not in the cities but outside cities and uh, not in the metropolitan cities mainly but outside metropolitan cities in small cities and small towns they are there in case of sparrow population shift has been instead of population decline yes true it is a it is not of the shift local decline why 
so in eco ecology we used to through three kinds of terms so there is an extinction so extinction of a species ki wo pura species khatam ho jata hai now there is something called local extinction so you might say that the sparrows has been locally extinct but they are present elsewhere so neha i think that is that will be the answer to your question now uh, aman uh, uh, as a question here uh, uh, if people have proper food availability then may be they don't have to search for meat and that kind of food for survival is this can help in conservation in any way uh, aman i think uh, this is a very age old debate of the choice of food that we have so a lot of people would like to have meat but i am sure that nobody wants to have meat of a tiger they are not to be eaten so they are killed for some different reasons so food probably is not uh, uh, may not be a very huge driver there but there are food choices which can be uh, you know uh, fulfilled through other means rather than killing wild animals that's that is something uh, probably more appropriate uh, in that context what we can do for sacrifice of animals at holy places stop them ban them they are banned already our sparrow seem to have increased in population some months into the pandemic sir so this is my personal observation in my hometown yes ambika you are right uh, uh, this is a report coming from some places because just very recently i have uh, uh, some friends some bird watchers and photographers from different parts of the country they have reported a increase in the number of birds around them it is probably because of the decrease in noise pollution there is during the lockdown there is uh, no traffic anywhere so noise pollution nahi hai disturbance nahi hai probably uski wajah se local movements bad gaye honge and that could be one of the reason okay so uh, i recently watched a gunjan uh, as i watched a documentary movie uh, shark water extinction by robert stewart in which he exposed the illegal shark fin industry as a prominent during years of hunting or any other aquatic uh, species has been suffering the same as you showed in your examples yes uh, there are many aquatic species suffering i mean in indian waters not that much we are not a very big uh, you no know, uh, fan of eating whales or eating sharks so we don't have that kind of hunting happening here but in nearby country japan uh, china that kind of hunting is happening in large numbers so uh, uh, india mein ek hi species hai jo marine species hai which is probably the endangered uh, list is the dugong apart from that uh, we don't have any acidic land confined to gear leading in breeding may affect species survival what's your comment on it so the suchran so you have asked a very good question yes uh, so he points out the in breeding and the lack of genetic diversity in the acidic lion population so we have just one population of acidic lion in india as we know in the gear forest reserve and uh, there is a large amount of in breeding basically in breeding means ki they are uh, breeding within their own relatives so the genetic diversity jo hai wo unka bahut kam ho chuka hai so they are very much under threat in fact there is a very good plan of uh, uh, the the delhi biodiversity uh, board to real and they have also created some of the scientists working here they have created an alternative habitat for lion in kuno wildlife sanctuary so if this if some lions can be transferred from there to kuno they will have another population there uh, okay so tanu i also observed uh, different species of birds in the lockdown yes true sir any comments on the decline of vultures in india i read that one main reason was drug diclofenac yes nandini very rightly you said diclofenac was definitely the reason that uh, the vulture population had declined so diclofenac was a veterinary drug used in uh, cattle and uh, they were used in large quantities in and in, in across the country and because of that uh, the vulture population and it was fatal to vultures so the cattle spread on the vulture the vulture uh, no the vultures fed on the cattle the cattle were contaminated and that's where the population declined i think we will stop the question answer session we'll have to resume the next session as well okay so uh, let's uh, let's take uh, stop the after bharti don't, don't put up any uh, any more questions we'll stop here uh, if you have still some questions left queries left we will discuss it at the end okay so renalini is asking rock pigeons are said to be invasive for us is this a myth no absolutely right they are invasive species in fact uh, we are currently working in a project we are Uh, uh looking at the impact of invasives on native species and we have included rock pigeons in as one of them and uh, as as some of you would uh, know definitely that what are invasive species which have come from outside they have a wide uh, you no know, uh, population they spread a lot and that's uh, you know and uh, and they definitely impact your native biodiversity so true rock pigeons are invasive and they have impacts uh bharti i am just taking the last question from bharti after that we will take up questions at the end 
so now i want to know more about the relevance of project tiger today after knowing that what we had and what we have done also in a news article i read that india would soon launch project dolphin in order to boost and promote healthy river ecosystem could you please elaborate on what would be india's approach that's a long question uh, approach regarding that and being they are two different things now project tiger started in 1972 is a success is a success because from where we started we started with a very poor number of roughly around 500 we went to a very good number so uh, it is definitely a success and we have today reached to 3000 we have last number of roughly around 40 uh, 38 40 tiger reserves in india so uh, it is a success dolphin project is very simple to launch and uh, uh, dolphins in india we have one river dolphin species in india Uh, which is the Gangetic River dolphin. So there are two major habitats: the like River Ganga uh, in the northern plains, and the other habitat is the Chambal River. So you just have to conserve or create a corridor of conservation around these two rivers, and the dolphin conservation is done. So uh, I think that uh, let us stop the question answer sessions for this section here, and let us start the new section. Uh, you want a break, uh, two or three minutes of break, and then we should resume. What What is the suggestion, General? Uh, opinion on this yeah during lockdown gangetic dolphins are seen frequently yes okay so uh, this 1533 we are just taking 2 minutes of break at 335 we will uh, will join or 2 3 minutes of break okay i would suggest you that you do not log out from your systems because uh, we are taking attendance the there is an extension in the google meet only which is also taking keeping a record of uh, everyone who has joined the meeting so do not leave the meeting just stay here the next session is a small one so we will quickly finish and we will be done for the day okay thank you
Okay, so uh, let's start with the, uh, I hope everyone has joined now and is back. Uh, so we have a small uh, you know, section or uh, a portion to discuss and then we will take a, uh, you know, uh, conclude our today's session. So uh, what we have and what are we doing? So we have some good amount of biodiversity in India. So biodiversity as we, it's a very bookish definition we all know variety and variability of species. So there were, I could see that there were some questions uh, related to genetic diversity and, 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 and lions and that, that part that we discussed. So the variety of species, the number of species that we have and the variability, that's what includes the biodiversity. So in world, if we see, we have around 17 to 20 uh, lakh species, 2 million species in the world. And, uh, but this is just the number of species that we know of. Uh, this number could very well go to 100 million. So it's a huge number of species that we have uh, in the world. So, uh, and uh, uh, if you look at the largest groups among all, so we have largest number of animals. If you look at the total, all life forms. So we have around 75% uh, of animal species, then plants 15%, and then protista, fungi, and archaea are a small percentage of what overall uh, biodiversity that we have in the world. And then if we expand these animals, we look at the group, the largest group uh, around, among uh, you know, animals is the insects, 72%. And then the other animals, 7.5% directly smolas, then we have those. And the vertebrates, if we expand them, the mammals, amphibians, reptiles, birds, and fishes, we have largest amount of largest uh, you know, fish diversity, around 24,900 species in the world. And birds, we have around 10,000 species. Reptiles, we have around 7,000 species. Amphibians, 5,200. Mammals, we have roughly around 4,600 species in the world. So we have a huge number of species around us, large number of biodiversity. But what is alarming is that they're also declining at a very fast rate. So uh, this is just a basic book. So we will not be spending a lot of time in these uh, you know, concepts of hotspots and, and the, the theoretical concepts because you can get these concepts very easily from any book. The whole idea of this uh, course is to give you, uh, you know, something beyond the the uh, the knowledge of the textbooks. So these are the biodiversity hotspots around the world and as probably you would know that the concept of hotspots was given by uh, Norman Myers and uh, he identified these uh, you know, hotspots, around 30 hotspots around the world with uh, the uh, the two criteria. Now these hotspots, they are having at least 1500 species of endemic vascular plants and they had lost around 70% of their primary vegetation. So they are the hotspots of biodiversity in the world. And in India, if you see, there are four biodiversity hotspots. We have uh, uh, Eastern Himalaya, Western Ghats, and uh, which are completely within India. And the two of the hotspots, the, uh, uh, the Northeast region, which falls into the Indo-Burman hotspot, and the Andaman and Nicobar Islands, which falls into the Sundaland hotspot. So that's the, uh, the areas of the world which are rich with biodiversity. The next concept uh, uh, of, of biodiversity distribution is uh, the concept of mega diverse countries. Now this concept was given by Russell Mittermeier. Now what he did is a very simple job. So he realized that if we, uh, if we divide the whole uh, uh, world into different uh, biodiversity hotspots or, or see if you have identified the biodiversity hotspots around the world as we see in this slide. Now one of the biggest challenges was that some of these hotspots were actually cutting across international boundaries. Now it was very important to implement any effective conservation strategy, any effective conservation plan uh, in a hotspot which is in say four different countries. So because all the four countries will have different wide, wide, uh, wildlife laws, different 
protection laws. So, and definitely there are some international treaties which are applicable on most of them, but uh, they would differ in their regional laws. So, the the concept was then uh, the the another concept was developed by Russell Mittermeier. So, what he did is that he identified political units, seventeen countries in the world, which were around ten percent of the global surface area. But had more than seventy percent of the world's biological diversity. So, ये पूरे जो green color में जो countries दिख रही हैं, the list of these seventeen countries: Australia, Congo, Madagascar, South Africa, China, India, Indonesia, Malaysia, New Guinea, Philippines, Brazil, and others, uh, including US. They had around seventy percent of the world's total species, total biodiversity. But they were only covering around ten percent of the total geographical area or total global surface. So, it is very uh imperative that we understand that these political units are the one where we should focus more in terms of conserving implementing our conservation uh, no uh, no plans and actions now coming to uh, the local uh, uh, level not uh, and looking at india we are divided into 10 different biogeographic regions now these biogeographic regions are identified on the basis of uh, their uh, uh, type of biodiversity that they have the regional biodiversity that they have so the similarity and the dissimilarity in the biodiversity what we mean is the similarity in the species that they that a particular region will have or the community that a particular region will have will led to the division of these 10 biogeographic zones in india so trans himalayan region we have himalayan region semi arid gangetic plains desert northeast deccan peninsula region coastal region western ghats and islands looking at these names itself we are not going into detail of these because then it will become a little bit boring looking at each of them one by one but this gives you a very good idea a very clear idea that we have multitudes of habitat in our country we have almost every kind of habitat starting from deserts to mountain ecosystems to mangrove forest in coastal regions to uh, you know our uh, you know dry deciduous forest in central highlands to alpine and subalpine vegetation in upper himalayas so you name a kind of vegetation a rainforest in kerala rainforest in garo and khasi hills in northeast so we have all kinds of habitat in the country and uh, consider, considering the amount of uh, uh, you know, biodiversity that we have we have an enormous pool of biodiversity resource in india and we are the custodian of that pool that makes our job a little bit much more difficult so uh, uh, i i just wish to give you a brief idea of these uh, categories of iucn now iucn is a international organization we all probably some of you would definitely know about iucn international union for of Conser for conservation of nature and natural resources now they have divided the world species into these categories now these categories are very simple and uh, any known species in the world Uh, and if it has been classified it uh, you know and has been evaluated under some of these iucn category it will be placed in these so either the species is extinct so extinct simply means the species is gone like for in uh, you know from india we have species uh, uh, you know uh, gone extinct uh, like uh, <clears throat> we have uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the the uh, there is a species of rhino which is known as the sumatran rhino this is the last known species which has gone extinct from india so that is uh, there with any of extinct and wild so which is uh, the only uh, the species which have gone extinct in their natural populations but kahin pe zoo mein ya kahin conservatory mein ya conservation breeding centers mein humne unko rakha hua tha extinct and wild hai fir ye jo teen categories hain critically endangered endangered and vulnerable in the decreasing order of their population size in some other criteria they are placed so critically endangered is almost about to go extinct then endangered and then we are vulnerable then near threatened they are as of now they do not qualify to be in any of the upper categories the vulnerable endangered critically endangered but they are, they can go uh, in any of these category very soon then we have least concern lc and then we have data deficient and not evaluated so for some species humne unko evaluate hi nahi kiya they are so abundant for for example mosquitoes we are not going to evaluate the population of mosquitoes for any of the uh, the uh, the category now these are some of the uh, the the images of uh, no of some species from india which are actually uh, you no know, facing serious threat and uh, i have also given the name them so jordan's cursor 
is uh, is one of the uh, most important species that I would like to talk about. Now, Jordan's cursor is uh, <coughs> is almost about to go extinct. Now, after two thousand nine, there is not even a single sighting of this bird in India, and uh, the only habitat where Jordan's cursor is found is there are four districts, three districts in Andhra Pradesh now. The uh, uh, Anandpur, Kudappa, and Nellore district in Andhra Pradesh. That is the only habitat for Jordan's cursor. And uh, repeated, uh, you know, expeditions to rediscover this species has failed over a period of past fifteen years or so. Yeah, almost eleven years. Two thousand nine me last dekha tha ye, aur uske baad se we have no record of Jordan's cursor anywhere. So in all likelihood, the species might have gone extinct, but we are still hopeful that we may revive the species some day the next species great indian bustard is a state bird of rajasthan again critically endangered bird now this is this has some uh, uh, no this is a very small population of 300 individuals only living in a very small area in rajasthan uh, tiger we know there's a lot of things that we have discussed about tiger acidic lion in gir around 650 individuals left in that national park in gujarat so they can go extinct at any point of time uh forest owlet now critically endangered species found in nasik in maharashtra the only sighting that i had ever had was in nasik uh in maharashtra and that is also one of the reason where it is most commonly found now uh forest owlet uh, was last seen in 1965 uh and after that it was considered to be extinct in india now until uh, 2004 when pamela rasmussen and uh, Uh, and some of their students they rediscovered forest owlet in maharashtra so that was a very uh, you know amazing discovery uh, you know uh, in, in the recent times then red panda again uh, is is the population in northeast is facing extreme uh, uh, you know you can say hunting and then loss of habitat these are the problems which are uh, you know bringing the red panda population down rhinos uh, fortunately have uh you know brought some good news to us now the one one rhino was actually endangered at one point of time and this is the probably the only species in india which has actually improved its its category so from endangered it has come to vulnerable so uh, <coughs> now uh, they they had a very small they uh, population of them left in northeast in kaziranga mostly that now due to effective conservation efforts and due to you know very strong ground patrolling by the kaziranga uh you no know, uh, patrolling group and the assam forest department we have around uh, 2500 rhinos uh, you no know, roaming freely in the uh, in, in the park so we have a good population over there snow leopards uh, uh, they are vulnerable they are found in a very uh, you no know, you know, small patch of habitat in uh, in the upper parts of uh, himalaya so uh, then ganjari dolphin as we just discussed the uh, ganges and chambal they are also endangered so these are some of the species which are majestic which are flagship which are probably the torch bearer of conservation in india and we should definitely you know uh, you know gather our attention towards these these are the ones which are actually going to bring a uh, you know, lot of attention towards biodiversity conservation issues in india so uh, that is there now you would be surprised to see just a uh, uh, that out of all these species the three of them which are critically endangered are birds I and mean, it's just uh, 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 the enigma that uh, birds despite of the fact are one of the most commonly seen biodiversity around us the three critically endangered species is uh, and and which are known uh, there are many other uh, species as well are actually birds at least in this slide itself they are birds so uh, that is that now let us talk a little bit about the policies that we have in india the wildlife conservation is a very uh, 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 it's an issue which has been addressed in our constitution and different policy uh, tools very uh, no uh, in a very in a very wide manner so uh, the environmental protection act uh, protection is a fundamental duty of every citizen in india so there are two articles article 51 ag and article 48 a there is another article 21 which actually talks about the conservation of wildlife and 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 conservation of environment so um, uh, i just uh, place these two articles here because they talk of wildlife conservation and they are the articles in indian constitution so article 51 ag it says that it shall be the duty of every citizen of india to protect and improve the na the natural environment forest wildlife and all and then article 48a 
which is actually uh, which actually imposes the responsibility of wildlife conservation on the state uh, that states shall endeavor to protect and improve the environment by state here what we mean is the both the state and the central government the government should actually take those uh, initiatives so uh, what let's look at the wildlife protection act 1972 it is a very strong tool uh, came in india in 1972 uh, and the first thing that they did is that uh, they transferred the uh, the wildlife from state list to concurrent list and uh, <coughs> we had this indian board for wildlife ibwl which was created in 1952 and uh, this board was given the task of setting up wildlife sanctuaries and national parks and biosphere reserves in india and uh, this act also provided for the constitution of central zoo authority so aap ex situ conservation kar rahe hain in in terms of zoo in situ conservation kar rahe hain in terms of national parks and wildlife sanctuaries etc so there a whole a whole design of conservation policy was just, was made through this under this act there was a ban on trade there was a ban on commerce and uh, you know captive breeding ke proposals aaye and which led to establishment of uh, captive breeding programs for many endangered species including vultures including pygmy hawk including great indian bustard uh, so in a nutshell that that's what wildlife protection act does but all these things you can find there on internet uh, there's a lot of information available all this information will also be available on the courses website but what is interesting to know after this uh, that even after all these things there are 100 elephants slaughtered every day for their tusks and large number of tigers are being killed and the recovery of tigers in india is 463 seizures 625 tigers and that is the span of roughly around 20 years i if i can say and there's another picture of uh, you can see uh, a rhino being killed for its horn and uh, you know so basically the, the rhinos are mostly killed for their horn which is made up of a certain kind of keratin which is uh, actually sold in a very uh, larger sum of money in global market so jo hunters hote hain they don't kill these rhinos for uh, uh, for their meat or anything they just capture the rhino catch the rhino they dart them and uh, then they cut the horn they don't care to put a bandage or something they just leave them and most of these rhinos actually bleed to death so they just they are just for instance this picture here and some of the curious uh, you no know, kids from the village are just coming and looking at the carcass so the rhinos is actually bleeding to death then we have forest conservation act and something that has actually led to a lot of uh, conservation efforts in india uh, so the first thing that they did they transferred the forest from state to the uh, the union list and uh, the state government was given the power to use forest for non forestry purposes but if you want to do any forestry related activity uh, non forestry related activity like mining or you uh, know uh, establishment of any industry so all that has to be done through proper permission uh, you know the proper eia and and uh, you know process and uh, this union government will be a part of that decision making process now the image that i have shared here on this uh, this uh, slide is a is a bit interesting to you for you to see the the cycle of the forest so the cycle is actually conceptualized under the joint forest management now what jfm started from west bengal in a small district the the forest range of is the arabari range so the from the arabari district of west bengal joint forest management started by a very enthusiastic uh, uh, forest officer a dfo and and the idea of joint forest management was to involve the local people the villagers uh, the forest dwelling communities into forest conservation so uh, they were uh, and this was all done on a profit sharing basis so the forest department people will be working towards forest conservation they will be assisted by the local people in 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 the in the process of a forestation in the process of conserving trees in the process of conservation of species and protection to the wildlife and all this thing was done in return of some amount of or exchange of some amount of uh, you no know, profit that the forest department will get will be given to these local people so the exchange of profit or the profit sharing basis per is pure uh, joint forest management program ko shuru kiya gaya now <coughs> the idea of uh, the forest conservation act uh, no and then the jfm then took forward and then it took into uh, account 
the uh, the conservation issues like conservation of specific species jaise aap tiger project launch kar rahe hain ya abhi humne kuch discuss bhi kiya tha in some questions so the launching of tiger project or the lion project or crocodile project so you bring in the local people into these conservation efforts so that is important at international level we have convention on biological diversity what we call cbd another policy a very strong policy tool uh, which came in existence in 1992 and uh, india also became a signatory of cbd so earth summit in 1992 it happened and then there was a the uncd united nations conference on environment and development in uh, and within that the cbd was signed so there were three goals of cbd now the most important goal was to promote the conservation of biodiversity then the sustainable use of its components because we all knew that the biodiversity in all its form because a large uh, portion of biodiversity is actually consumed in form of food the food what we eat so it is it is important to ensure that we are doing that in a sustainable way we will just see uh, you know very soon that how we are left with only few amount of food crops um, uh, in the world that we can consume and large number of food crops are actually lost so the sustainable use of biodiversity and the sharing of biodiversity resources biological resources and genetic resources was actually equitable means uh, uh, so if any country say we are fighting with uh, you know a viral pandemic today so if there any country finds a certain medicine or certain uh, you know cure or maybe any uh, you know uh, the sort of from from plants or medicine from plants or any other animal resource so they will have to share it with all the signatory of cbds so you cannot say that okay this plant grows in my country and i'll only i'm the only one who will keep it i'll prepare the medicine i'll sell it to you but i'll not i won't give you this plant but i won't give you this particular flower or this particular species so that is not accepted so the equitable sharing of genetic and biological resources was uh, was ensured in uh, some way through convention on biological diversity so we just briefly talk about the loss of biodiversity what were the primary drivers we know about these basic things we won't discuss a lot habitat loss we know a uh, deforestation loss of habitat in 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 forest in the loss of aquatic habitat uh, due to pollution and uh, you know these are some of the reasons invasives we have discussed a little bit invasives for instance uh, we took an example uh, you know about pigeon so uh, they coming to uh, uh, so if they are in a in a region so i'll just give you a very simple uh, observation or an example as uh, so you might have seen delhi mein uh, we have those road sites in which uh, where people uh, on the uh, you know, uh, people uh, you know, throw seeds and and place some food for birds and uh, the only thing and if you go to see you will find large number of pigeons uh, you know flocking on those uh, you no know, artificial feeding sites and they will be feeding on those uh, you no know, uh, those grains and uh, the artificially laid down food but what you will not find that uh, you won't find any other fruit eating bird over there and that would be that will definitely please uh, next time notice uh, in delhi we have large number of fruit uh, no grainy grainy vorous birds as we call them we have bulbuls we have uh, no babblers we have warblers which feed on grains but you won't ever find them there on those sites because they are small in size the pigeon is large it is the one which can bully all of them out of those feeding sites so invasives are a problem over exploitation humne bahut baat kari hai we won't take up much time pollution we will discuss in one of the uh studies later and uh, then climate change so these are some of the issues now pollution as i told you so this is an image of uh, <coughs> we were studying painted stork uh, uh breeding ecology uh no and and this is a three year uh, data that i'm i'm just showing you so there's a small pond uh, uh, in uh, in a in a village called chada near matra now this pond has a central island and on those trees these stork species used to nest now over a period of time in 2013 14 and 15 and as you can see the how the habitat the front and the rear side there are two uh, size sides of the image that i have taken how the habitat has actually deteriorated over a period of time and this act also led to uh, we uh, i'll just show you the number of uh, you no know, individuals of four different species nesting there so ye ye four birds the jo yahan nest kar rahe the painted stork white ibises open bills and gray herons and over a period of time you can see there is a marked decline in their number so i just wanted to show you that how the quality of habitat 
and this is actually due to pollution what is happened what has happened in this pond is all the pollution load is coming into the pond and due to the eutrophication and the growth of icornia you can see the entire pond is uh, you know has actually turned into a vegetated uh, body so the pollution in a water body decline in habitat is how translate how much translating into the decline in population of different species is very much evident from this figure so that's another uh, aspect now we will uh, uh, just quickly talk a little bit about these uh, uh, conflict issues and that will be the end of this unit uh, this section what we have so man and wildlife conflict now that's another major uh, you know, contention between uh, in conservation of biodiversity so what to do i mean in this very uh, disturbing image and very uh, you know provoking image you can see a leopard actually eating the uh, no not eating but actually grabbing the head of a forest uh, official and unfortunately the forest official in this image died this is an image from west bengal and uh, he he succumbed to his injuries he was alive after uh, no uh, no confrontation with the leopard but why has this leopard become so aggressive that is a question now these elephants in the inset you can see here uh, people uh, throwing fireballs at them just to keep them away from their village so this happens I and mean, this is the reality for people who are living for villagers who are living close to forest areas they very frequently see that the wild animals are coming into their habitat but what we actually don't realize is that we are the one who have intruded in their habitat and that is where all this confrontation is coming because the human and wildlife conflict the genesis of human and wildlife conflict is the uh, intrusion of people and wildlife into each other's habitat so we intrude going into their habitat they coming into our habitat and that actually leads to this whole human and wildlife conflict issues so i'll just quickly uh, show you a couple of uh, uh, pointers here so what is the reason behind human and wildlife interactions and and conflicts so deforestation loss of habitat decline in prey uh, animals who were injured now this is important uh, so in fact you would have heard of many tigers being becoming man eaters so they are going into villages and killing people now if you go out and read jim corbett and kenneth anderson they will give you an excellent narratives of all the man eating tigers of india uh, and man eating leopards as well so most of these man eaters are actually animals who are who have got injured and who are actually old animals so their ability to forage in their natural to hunt in their natural habitat has they have lost their their, their, their ability so they are actually going out into the, the villages and uh, targeting one of the most easiest prey animal and one of the most easiest prey animal is us so that's why these tigers are becoming man eaters so this is something that we should know about man eating tigers and before taking a gun to personally shoot one of them off uh, we should know that uh, they are already injured animals and some of them are actually injured uh, in some failed hunting attempts so someone went to the forest wanted to kill a tiger but could not get a good shot so just uh, you know broken a part of its jaw so it, i mean this is a story of one of the major uh, you no know, uh, no one of the uh, main character of a story in jim corbett's uh, you no know, narrative so then growing human population uh, is another reason what are the results of human wildlife conflict crop damage animal deaths loss of human life injuries to people injuries to wildlife as we have just discussed so what we can do to reduce this human and wildlife interaction we can do fencing uh it is not always useful but in the case of animal and uh, uh, elephant conflict fencing is sometimes very useful in terms of reducing the uh, the conflict issues then land use planning is a problem uh and then livestock protection is an is an issue uh, 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 is one way in which we can deal with that so uh, we put some protective barrier uh, no protection around our livestock in villages then that can prevent that Uh, there is a very interesting story of uh, lions uh, uh, no, uh, and, 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 and a young boy in, in Africa. Uh, uh, I think we have some time. I'll just quickly narrate that to you. So uh, there was a young boy in Africa who was, uh, uh, who was awarded uh, the, uh, the Green, uh, uh, the Whitley Award. Now the Whitley Award goes to someone who has done some very, uh, it's, it's also known as a Green Nobel Prize. Uh, so it's uh, to someone who has done some really innovative way of preserving wildlife and reducing the human and wildlife conflict so what he did was that uh, he realized that uh, a lot of these lions which are living very close to his his house uh, because they live in a uh, the story is from kenya 
so uh, these uh, lions were actually coming into the animal dens and take, lifting their cattle and because of that the cattle in the uh, uh, the cattle owners were actually uh, you know, uh, you know turning enemy towards the lions and they were killing lions at the first sight so he designed a very innovative way so he put up a uh, you no know, he designed a electric board in which a light bulb was uh, you no know, swinging from here to here something like this and this and he used to switch this on and put it in front of the cattle uh, you no know, shed uh, every night so the lions used to think that there is someone with a torch moving into the cattle shed and they never attacked and uh, this was although a very small uh, uh, this thing uh, uh you no know, uh, technological innovation but uh, uh, you no know, bought a lot of lions saved from being killed by the angry uh, cattle owners so uh, that's what we had to discuss in this man and wild life conflict now uh, uh, and that's what we all had to discuss and what we have now i just also want to give you a brief uh, idea of what we will have and what we should do because uh, what we are going to have is uh, is is not uh, you know if we continue exploiting our biological resources at the same pace that we are currently doing so we are not going to be left with much of uh, what we have and the current species extinction rate in fact to tell you uh, we are actually going through an uh, ex you know a species extinction era this was a decade of extinction so some of the common species will remain but many of the species which are flagships and which are actually facing huge threats of extinction Uh, without any positive intervention it is very difficult to conserve them and in fact uh, there are scientists who you know, there are scientific reports who have also placed ideas that many species are getting extinct even before they are recorded to kai to aise species hain jinka naam bhi humne abhi nahi rakha humne abhi unko discover hi nahi kiya tha aur usse pehle wo extinct ho gaye so we don't even know about them so uh, uh, here i'll just stop i'll show you a small uh, film from fao and that will give you a good idea of this and then we will have a small discussion at the end uh someone let me know if the voice is not audible during the the audio is not uh, there in the film then uh, let me know okay so uh, so i think we have discussed this part and uh, so this this uh, you know this particular documentary was actually to show you that uh, you know if we or the, the rate at which with we are losing species we might even lose our food so that is where the food and agriculture organization of un comes into picture it talks about how uh, the crucial biodiversity resource is not only important for us to save for conservation of species itself 
but also to preserve our own survival, to conserve our own survival, and to ensure that we have a food security for our large and growing population. So, what we can do? So, the, uh, I'll just uh, now we'll conclude today's session with a small idea of what we call a citizen science. So, what we can do is, and uh, no, it's, it's just defined as so. So, this is the idea of uh, involving uh, the general public. Uh, common people who could be students, who could be nature enthusiasts, wildlife filmmakers, photographers, anybody who is going into wild spaces or even not into wild spaces, you are just moving out of your house and you are seeing something, record that data and put it up uh, no, and, and use that data to create a scientific or a much, uh, you know, what we call a, <coughs> a, a, a scientific monitoring. So citizen science is the involvement of people into collection of scientific data right so it is a very good uh, you know uh, you know, uh, you know innovative way of collecting large uh, you no know, data data uh, you know, creating large data sets with limited resources so one of the major outcome of uh, citizen science is the state of india's birds report so uh, we have roughly around 1300 species of birds in india and uh, to monitor the population of each one of them is not possible. So even though and with a handful of scientists and researchers who are working on, in this field. So what has been done in past is to uh, know uh, that all the bird watchers and bird photographers, they have collected their data, they have collected their sightings through the citizen science project. There is a portal called eBird. So they have uploaded all their data on the eBird and they came up with uh, you know, 25 years of trend line of population decline and, and appraisal and they came up with this brilliant document uh, called state of india's birds 2020 it is it come just came just this year so uh, the link of this document will be available on the website you can check it from there as well so uh, we have around 867 species which were assessed under this uh, no particular uh, initiative and uh, Uh, and uh, around 101 of them were high conservation concerns and uh, 319 were of moderate conservation concerns, 442 were of low conservation concern. So these are the some of the examples of how citizen can, science can also uh, improve uh, our data collection and monitoring. So participation in GBBC, Great Backyard Bird Count, uh, this is a very uh, you know, interesting event that is organized every year. So just go out of your house count your birds for 15 minutes and put it on the e-bird. So these kind of things that you can do. Okay. So the whole idea of bringing citizen science together, as we discussed, but we have seen uh, in, in, in what happened and what we had done in the past and what kind of uh, you know, biodiversity loss that we have seen, what we have, what are the steps that we are going to take. And at the end, uh, so uh, what is in our own hand, what we can do? People who are scientists and researchers and are working in this field, they will extensively monitor a particular species, a particular population, and they will give us some idea about what is happening and what not. And, but what as a common people we can do is that we can create some data like this. The other thing that we can do is that we can create, we can generate voices. So if there is any, uh, for instance, uh, we have recently seen some uh, sort of revision in the EIA notification 2020, and there were so many uh, you know, uh, you know, petitions signed by different people, by school students, by college students, uh, you know, from universities, from NGOs, and different groups, and which were, uh, you know, which uh, which raised people's, uh, which raised our voices against these, uh, you know, policies which uh, which can have a negative effect on the biodiversity. So we have to be vocal about what we what is going wrong we have to speak up we have to create democratic pressure on the government that this should not be done and if you see uh, in past in, uh, in in many environmental movements whether it is narmada bachava andolan or whether it is uh, uh, your chipko movement this is one of the biggest forest conservation movement in the world and uh, then uh, we have these uh, you know other isolated incidences of Chip, uh, no, the Silent Valley movement and this noise. And so we have always seen that these, uh, the, the positive voices raised from general public has made significant impact in conservation of biodiversity and species. So that is uh, where I would just like to conclude our today's session. So we, uh, uh, we celebrate International Day for Biological Diversity on 22nd of May. So uh, I would request all of you to, uh, no, to do that as another way of 
uh, no, uh, putting up your voice for biological diversity. In fact, the 2011 and 2020, this decade, was the United Nations decade on biodiversity. So we are just about to end the UN's decade on biodiversity. So I wish you all happy biodiversity. And, uh, and uh, we will just conclude today's session and just open up uh, this session for questions from this part or any other. Thank you. Okay, so uh, uh, for 4.30, we have around 13 minutes left and we would like to conclude the uh, whichever way. So any queries, any general question, anything that we had uh, probably left in the last session to discuss, uh, we can uh, have that discussion now. Yes. What can be effective ways of dealing with uh, Sanchita has asked of with invasive uh, species. So there are uh, there are some ways in which you can deal with them. Now one of the first way is an effective quarantine. Now in India we are, we are very poor in doing that. So most of these invasive species are actually coming through uh, you know, trade routes, through tourism and some other methods. For instance, uh, uh, the lantana uh, you know, is, a, is a weed, is a shrub uh, which, which came into India uh, you know, uh, you know, through uh, shipping. So the seeds of lantana came to India through that. And now these lantana grow in almost every part of the country. And uh, you know, it has covered a large amount of forest region in some of our tiger reserves as well. And in fact, just today, it is a report in Times of India that a uh, you know, large number of tiger habitat has been covered by lantana in our tiger reserves. So that is a problem. So that is one way is quarantine. Um, so if you go to US and if you're you know, passing uh, through the screening process in a, on an airport, they will put you through a biological screening. So uh, if there is any, even a small seed uh, stuck in the, you know, you know uh, in, in, in the soles of your shoes, uh, they would ask you to, uh, you know, remove that, throw it out and then move into the country. So quarantine is important. Uh, uh, then uh, we have questions. Priya, uh, sir, what steps should be taken to raise the, to save rhino in Assam due to flood? Uh, floods in Assam are a problem. Now, they, are a, they have been a problem from past few years. Uh, so what to do? Now, there are you know, people who suggest that let us try to relocate rhinos to some other habitats. For instance, uh, uh, the government has now, uh, the Assam and the UP government has had a joint task force, which has relocated rhinos into Dudhwa National Park in Uttar Pradesh. So you create an alternative habitat uh, you know, uh, for that. So uh, that's one uh, way in which you can... Uh, create an alternative habitat but nevertheless those who are there they will also keep on uh, they will of that population of Assam will face problem so uh, why is the flood coming that is one of the question so uh, I mean we have to actually go into those factors which are uh, you know causing the flood in Assam which is uh, you know uh, indiscriminate urbanization in different places near the river beds and flood plains if we stop that then we can control the flood and then the save these rhinos uh, Tanu asks, uh, how can we enforce articles and environmental conservation under the Indian constitution? They're already enforced. We have Wildlife Protection Act is enforced uh, uh, as yesterday, Professor Mahesh Rangrajan was also pointing out that we might have flawed laws, but uh, even the flawed laws are fl flouted in our country. So we have to actually work on that, that with the proper implementation should be there. And uh, whatever are the, uh, the, uh, the, the provisions in the and these special acts should be uh, properly implemented. I think that is the only way. Uh, Priya, uh, how we can make sustainability to being accessible to poor section of the society as well? Uh, this is a difficult question. Sustainability as a concept, we will be taking this up in the last uh, no, theme uh, when we will discuss global climate change. Uh, uh, so we will take it up there. But uh, no, uh, still, I'll give you some idea that uh, I think that could be done. So sustainability is a, is an ideal concept. As I always say, it can 
probably never be achieved but uh, we are just trying to run towards the sustainability uh, you know concept we are basically trying to look at a way in which we utilize something now so that we leave something for our future generations difficult to bring to the to everybody difficult to uh, you know actually even implement in its totality but what can be done is that uh, equitable uh, sharing of resources natural resources especially it is for everybody and some of the government programs like uh, uh, joint forest management as i told you agroforestry is there then we have some programs related to rearing of honey bees in uh, in in local villages so these are the things that can actually help i mean uh, over the top i can see some of these things uh, how to create a general sense of responsibility among citizens on wildlife and environmental conservation there are means of uh, you know spreading information it could be through articles it could be through uh, you know uh, uh, films and documentaries through photographs through social media and so many other channels you can do that but the whole idea is that people should actually know that uh, conserving species is not about conserving some tiger which is sitting uh, not 1000 kilometers away from you uh, because someone might ask ki theek hai hum ek corbett reserve mein tiger ko conserve kar le to usse mujhe yahan delhi mein kya fayda hoga tiger wahan hai main yahan hu so uh, we have to uh, understand this thing that conserving species conserving habitat is actually about about our own survival so if you don't have tigers in the forest you don't have the herbivore numbers go up uh, as we know that the the food chain and uh, and the classic example the herbivores goes up the forest goes down then there will be flooding and then the whole sort of problems would be there so that is there uh, so that these are some of the ways in which we can generate awareness uh, chandni asked uh, thank you for interesting talk how can technology like photography and imagery be leveraged for conservation now these days conservation photography has taken a uh uh has come into four i mean i have uh, very good friends who uh, are uh, very uh, in fact professionally involved in conservation photography uh, photography uh, film making can be a good means in fact i also do a little bit of that so uh, it can be a very good means of bringing conservation issues uh, bringing information about some uh, you know cryptic species jo usually humko nazar nahi aata to people and to actually motivate people to uh, you know uh, somehow think about species that they have not seen so if they are even thinking about it and then they uh, uh, suddenly see a news item on the television about say some uh, pangolin or say some spiny tail eater they would they would be able to relate that particular item with something that they have already read somewhere or or maybe uh, you know uh, no saw have seen a small documentary or a film somewhere so it is important uh Assam flood problem is related to Brahmaputra River. Uh, not uh, no, Assam flood is not directly related to Brahmaputra, but yes, some of the tributaries of Brahmaputra are creating havoc. The whole idea is that uh, we have to somehow create a, 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 a sort of a, a, a barrier uh, where we are not having any urban construction, any concretization in the flood plains. That's the one thing. We should just simply stop that. We, I mean, I'm not saying that floods will not come. बिकॉज कई दफा फ्लड्स जो है वो इंटरनेशनल रिवर वाटर ट्रीटीज की वजह से होती है सो सम अदर कंट्री हैज सम ट्रीटी विथ यू एंड देन सडनली ड्यूरिंग द मॉनसून सीजन दे आर ओपनिंग देयर फ्लड केस एंड योर ओन कंट्री इज फ्लडेड से वी हैव प्रॉब्लम्स विद नेपाल इन द रिवर कोसी विद चाइना एंड ब्रह्मपुत्र सो दीस आर आल्सो द इश्यूज बट यस दे आर देयर सो लिप्सा आस्क दैट व्हेन देयर वर न्यूज़ फ्रॉम फ्यू इयर्स अगो रिगार्डिंग द डिक्रीज इन द नंबर ऑफ ऑलिव रेडली टर्टल एंड दे आर स्टिल डिक्रीजिंग व्हाट इज द कॉज ऑफ that and what can be done okay so i'll tell you a very interesting story about olive ridleys so a friend of mine uh, no uh, no has worked on the nesting of olive ridleys in orissa so there is a beach called gahir mata beach in orissa this is now declared as a wildlife sanctuary so uh, these olive ridleys they used to come over there and they nest they lay their eggs in you uh, know in, uh, inside the uh, and bury their eggs in the sand and they go back into the ocean and when these young uh, you know uh, turtles will come out and they will crawl out of the sand come onto those sandy beaches and go to the to the ocean now what local people not today but pre 2003 4 what they used to do because they didn't uh, well, some of these eggs were actually taken out so the olive ridleys are coming out of the ocean laying their eggs inside on the sea beach so they used to dig the uh, the nest and take out those eggs and uh, sometimes uh, in 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 and what the people have done is that they've also put small flags 
on the nesting site so that they will remember that yahan pe nesting hui thi and after the nesting is done when these turtles will are just about to hatch they will come and take these turtles away so uh, yeah, these are some of the things that has been done but now the whole area is conserved and uh, the only thing that can be done uh, for sea turtles is that we have to provide them adequate protection when they are coming on the beaches for nesting so those beaches has to be left untouched whenever they are coming for nesting which is only 12 15 days in the month of uh, no uh, march uh, february march to us time pe aap ek proper protection de de beaches mein and then i think the thing will be done so in biodiversity section i cannot answer different types of biodiversity or alpha or beta diversity uh, narendra we will be talking about that at the end so we will take it up don't worry uh, neha kosi uh, sir in the case of invasive species eucalyptus is an invasive don't for utilizing way too much water and hampering the true hampering uh, the growth of other plantations nearby but there are different opinions on the same by agro farmers what are your comments on the same opinions are definitely there because uh, there are two things about uh, you know, this uh, you know, i'll take some time uh, in in answering this question they have so one thing is about uh, there are farmers who are interested in going for plantation now plantation of large trees is easy uh, is not easy so because uh, plant if you plant a tree then uh, the sapling is yours is as it says but the moment you have planted a sapling and it grows into a tree it becomes a state property so if you want to cut that down you have to take permission from the state to cut it down so, and that's where the whole eucalyptus farming comes into picture because eucalyptus has been identified as an invasive species you don't need a permission from the forest department or from the state government to cut down the eucalyptus and that is one of the reason why farmers in different areas are actually going to eucalyptus farming because a aap agar inko lagate hain to aap inhe kaat bhi sakte hain they give you good furniture there is a eucalyptus oil uh, which you can be derived from the bark so you can have multiple layers of benefits deriving from the eucalyptus and you have the right to cut the tree itself so that aap usko timber mein bhi use kar sake so ye sabse important cheez hai jo hame uh, samajhni chahiye ki eucalyptus is despite invasive it has a lot of uh, scope for indian farmers and that's why they are going for it so uh, but otherwise uh, as we know you rightly said it is invasive and it has uh, no some serious uh, issues related to it so. oh so yeah. Am I audible? Yes, you uh, are. So, sir, uh, as far as I know, uh, turtles and keeping turtles as pets was banned in India, but they're rampantly sold, and even some people I know have kept turtles as pets. So, I would just like to know your comments in that, and maybe uh, what we can uh, do. If you have it. seen anybody keeping turtle, go and tell them that on another wildlife protection at 1972, they can be jailed for seven years and will be will get a fine of 1.5 lakh rupees or both. So, that is the first thing. and the second thing is that uh, uh, the the selling of turtle and there are uh, i mean there's definitely illegal there is no uh, arguing that point but how to if say if you see something happening of this sort somewhere what to do with it so there is a website i'll uh, if you want i can share the link of it it's called world uh, no wildlife crime control bureau so this is government of india ministry of environment and forest uh, no committee i am a member of that committee in fact uh because we have worked a lot in terms of you no know, uh, no releasing some of the captive animals so uh, you can report it to anybody you can just report it simply report it to me i'll i'll give you my uh, you know mail id is there already in the website so uh, course website so you can just report it to me and uh, if you are doing that click a picture of it and that is the best thing if you are seeing some say if you if you have seen turtles being sold on the road side click a picture of it uh, tell me the location and if it is best if you can Uh, give the coordinate also so that because road sides mein kai dafa ye dikkat hoti hai so that it can be retrieved easily and uh, i think the government takes a very strict action against those okay okay so uh, it's already 4:30 we have uh, you no know, finished our time for today's session uh, so uh, if there are any more questions we can very well go for uh, another 5 or 10 minutes and take up them uh, if you want uh, otherwise what uh, information i wanted to give you is that uh, on 20 the next session tomorrow is an off for this course so the next session will happen on 21st uh, so on 21st 230 i will request all of you to join 
uh, uh, Dr. K. S. Gopi Sundar will be coming, uh, and he will be talking about protection of species outside uh, protected areas. Now, uh, just to introduce you, uh, no, introduce him to you. Uh, he has worked a lot on sara strain conservation. He has uh, worked with International Crane Foundation. He is currently a scientist with NCF, and he is uh, also the chair of IUCN's. Uh, species survival commission so you can ask him uh, a lot of questions from different backgrounds uh, 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 one trivia about him that he was also listed as the 25 smartest indian by the outlook magazine so he was probably the only scientist uh, 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 known uh, no listed uh, given that uh, recognition by outlook so uh, interesting uh, lecture it is going to be and uh, I hope you all would be there for that. And uh, let's see you on 21st. Then, uh, if you have any questions uh, apart from this, uh, yes, uh, there is a any study materials share with us regarding topics discussed. Yes, uh, there is a, a tab on uh, the courses website, lectures and assignments. So after today, all these lectures, recorded lectures, will be available on that tab. Uh, no lectures and assignment. Please go and visit that tab. And I'll uh, what I'll do is that don't think that the website will go down after the course is over. I'll keep that website running as long as as I can. So that website will be there. You can download all the information uh, from there anytime that you want to. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. So uh, we we'll, we will meet uh, on twenty first. If you have any questions, any query, you can uh, mail. Uh, on the course uh, evs at ip.du.ac.in the uh, mailing address which is given on the courses website and uh, for any other information i have also given my personal number over there you can call me text me texting is easier you can text me and ask thank you everyone thank you very much so uh, i think all the participants can now uh, leave and uh, we will resume uh, on 21st we will meet again Thank you. Hello. 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 Ah, uh, yes. If you have any question, anyone, you can still ask. I am here for a while.